may not have thought of. You know one of the greatest things about Spider-Man's outfit, his costume? He is completely covered. So any kid could imagine he's Spider-Man because no color of the skin shows. He could be black under that, he could be red, he could be yellow, he could belong to any race. And that True. wasn't done purposely, it was done accidentally. But I think it was the best thing we did, making him so that he could be anybody under that costume. Anyone can be Spider-Man. That sentiment often attributed to creator Stan Lee in some form has always been the core of what makes the character perhaps the world's most famous superhero so accessible. It's the idea that by donning the mask, anyone could step up and be Spider-Man. Regardless of their race or gender, it became the central thesis for the excellent 2018 film Into the Spider-Verse, which widely popularized not just Miles Morales as the webhead but a slew of variants from across the multiverse. But it's also not entirely true, at least not in the video games. Since the dawn of Atari, there have been dozens of Spider-Man games. And despite the occasional hidden gems, most developers have struggled to embody what makes the wall crawler work. It isn't about the power fantasy or the rogues gallery, it's about the little things. It's about being the person behind the mask, whoever they may be. That's what 2018's smash hit Marvel Spider-Man got correct. And it's what makes it sequel to 2023's PlayStation 5 exclusive Marvel Spider-Man 2 the pinnacle of Spider-Man's story storytelling, or I should say one of the best storytelling when it comes to Spider-Man. The first thing I noticed about Marvel's Spider-Man 2 is the speed. Whether you're throwing down with an alley full of arsonist thugs or pirouetting between skyscrapers, Spider-Man 2 is at its best when you're just moving so fast. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 won me over immediately because you don't lose any of the abilities that you pick up during the games that came before it. Or at least I didn't immediately notice anything missing. As a result, if you're familiar with getting around New York City in the Marvel Spider-Man or the standalone Marvel Miles Morales' adventure, you'll immediately feel right at home. Many of the new traversal abilities just adds to your existing toolkit for getting around. And going places is so much fun that it will keep you entertained through several of the game's more route fetch quests. The best of these additions in my opinion are the web wings. Ridiculous armpitted mounted wings that allow you to glide around the expanded open world like some kind of a flying spider squirrel. You can fit glides in amongst the swing and web swing to get a little boost of speed. But these moves are also an effective way to get around when the nearby buildings are just so low to the ground. Essentially now that you can cross the river from Manhattan and venture out into other boroughs. The first thing I want to talk about this game is the combat. The combat in this game is similarly fast paced and frenetic. Most fights will involve you bouncing between enemies to knock them up on the air or slithering between their legs as you pinball around and dishing out violence in every possible direction. You have a fair bit of control but really you're just gently suggesting how the fight goes. It isn't precise in my opinion, but it's a lot of fun to play. The gadgets offer some valuable firepower and can change the makeup of a fight as they get more powerful and harder. And believe me, the fights in this game, they get real hard. Daddy. The two different Spider-Man, I'm bitterly disappointed that Insomniac didn't follow the aliens naming convention and call this game Marvel Spider-Mans by the way. It feels completely different as well, like Maz Morales has this bioelectric powers and the ability to turn invisible for a while and starts off feeling somewhat really strong and OP. But Peter Parker quickly gets a variety of new symbiote infused abilities that just makes him so much more powerful in combat. Especially when Peter got the anti-venom, that's where I was like, alright Peter Parker is actually fun to play with. I'm here! Because before Peter got the anti-venom powers or the venom powers, I would say that majority of the game, Peter was a bit of a drag to play as Spider-Man. Because at least with Miles Morales, you have durable options when it comes to combat. And with Peter, you only have one way of fighting. And this isn't me like shitting on Peter Parker as Spider-Man. It's just that Miles at the first part of the game was just really fun to play with. You can switch between them at any point with the press of just a couple of buttons. But the story really makes you spend a lot of time with each of the Spider-Man. In the first two thirds of the game, you're mostly fighting goons, whether they're villains of Craven's hunters or regular street criminals. The fights are all challenging and interesting against all of these enemies. Later on, you'll throw down against symbiote enemies and that's when things start to come apart a little bit. The symbiote enemies have some sort of mobility as you and are so durable. Fighting against them is often exhausting and there's so many enemies attacking you during the later fights, especially the finale, that it just drains your energy. Especially when you do the side quest of like the Venom High 
lives and you have to destroy them? Like, how the fuck are you supposed to survive that shit? But still, the strong story kept me going even as my enthusiasm was starting to wane. Marvel Spider-Man 2 tells an authentic comic book saga with a lot of moving parts and complicated characters throughout its runtime. The threats also come and go frequently. You don't really see Venom since he's like the game's headline villain until nearly two-thirds of the way through. But you'll definitely feel his influence throughout as you see the symbiote's impact in all over New York City. He's kind of like Lord Voldemort in a sense where you don't really see Lord Voldemort that much in the Harry Potter movies. But you can definitely feel like he's just lurking in the darkness. The next thing I want to talk about this game is the subtle changes. And before I talk about any changes, can I just say that Peter Parker in this video game kind of looks like Austin Reeves from the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm here! Yeah, he definitely is him. But something really interesting that really caught my attention is the way that Marvel Spider-Man 2 keeps you playing as Peter Parker even as the symbiote starts to affect him negatively. <sighs> That's the story I was telling you about. I wanted to get your thoughts. That's amazing, MJ. Can't wait to read it. Huh? I thought Connors was gonna help you get it off. What about Harry? Sorry, can we do this tomorrow? Just so beat from Lizard Wrangler. I got that thing on me. I got that stick. I got that tool, I'm packing. Parker goes from the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man to an angry anti-hero while under your control as the player. And while he doesn't notice the change, you will definitely feel it in the way he fights and the way the quips he delivers aren't so much barbed as delivered with the force of a sledgehammer. Like black suit Peter Parker does not hold back. His suit is the only reason I'm still alive. Yeah, it's pretty great, isn't it? Why don't you pop some more pills and say what you really feel? Hey. The truth is, I'm the hero here, not you. I am the hero, so shut up! By letting you play through this, the game delivers something I've never seen before. Building up this gargantuan threat so that when it comes time to deal with the symbiotes once and for all, you've already bought into the story. That story is paired with a tremendous sense of spectacle. From the opening of the game where you fight a skyscraper-sized Sandman, to its climactic final fight, I mean the action rarely lets up. A late game section where you control as Mary Jane as it switches to a third person shooter while she's blasting symbiotes is just so ridiculous that I kind of laughed because it kind of reminded me of Gears of War. <laughs> and that was one of the problems that I had with MJ in the first Spider-Man game is that I was a bit of like, eh, do I really need to play as her? I don't think so. But in this game, I would say that MJ is so playable, she's so different, and she's probably OP. Like this chick is literally taking out Craven Hunters and I'm like, bruh, how the fuck are you trained by one of the strongest animal hunters and you're getting your ass banked by a reporter. Oh, you move, motherfucker, you can't fight. But going back, the game hits more of these big ideas than it misses. It's probably the first media that actually made me care about Craven the Hunter. Or you could make an argument it's probably the second because the Spider-Man 90 show did Craven the Hunter pretty damn solid. There's a lot of fan service here as well, whether that's introducing new characters from the comic universe or just letting you do something cool that you've always wanted to do. I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, so you're just going to have to play the game, but as a Spider-Man fan, I saw plenty that made me grin like a fanboy. And before I get to my next point of the video, can I just say that the opening of Spider-Man 2 is just as good as God of War 3. Because if you remember God of War 3, which I'm assuming my audience in this channel knows God of War freaking 3, you'll know how epic the opening was for that game. And if you disagree with that statement, you know where the door is, my friend. The next thing I want to get into is the collections. There's a great collection of suits for both Peter and Miles, and special suit abilities are no longer tied to them. So it's mostly just making sure that the Spider-Man just look fly as hell. That suit's not an alien, is it? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also not digging the suit, Miles. Yeah, go, go, go change it. Change that suit. And what are those? Give me something cool. Give me something that does not scream Spider-Man. Something that's outside of the box. Ooh. Ooh, I like them capes. <laughs> I like them capes. But then again, it just comes down to personal preferences. If you like the new Miles Morales suit, then that's good for you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to be a hater. I'm not here to bash any of you Marvel fans. And if you're going to be that type of Marvel fanboy who 
is going to cry over a little tiny preference of my own personal taste and assume that I'm just a hater like bruh I just said it comes down to your own preferences. I just so happen to not like and vibe with the new suit and if you do love the new suit then I'm really happy for you. At the end of the day it just comes down to personal preferences so Marvel fans put that in your head. But going back you'll invest on a multitude of collectible currencies into your suit's technology which will buff you in a lot of different ways no matter what you're wearing. There are too many currencies in the game though to the point where it's almost dizzying and confusing trying to keep track of them all. However, I would say if you keep up a balanced diet of hitting icons on Spider-Man 2's map, you'll usually have enough to get what you want at any time. I just really dig this game a lot and I think in my opinion it's probably better than its first game. And this isn't me discrediting the first Spider-Man game because I still think the PS4 one still holds up perfectly today. I mean I still have my PS4 and whenever I replay the first Spider-Man game, I'm still amazed of how amazing this game is. It's just not better than the second one. The last thing I want to talk about before I end this video is the accessibility features. There's a heap of accessibility features in Marvel Spider-Man 2 with an outstanding amount of options for customizing the way the game actually plays. There are some robust presets that are, you know, pretty aimed at those with, you know, different needs when it comes to like vision, sound, motor controls, and even motion sensitivity. These will flick several different options on as presets. These options and several more are available to help with requirements and the options in this game are just so vast. Toggle switches allow you to reduce the game's speed, make chases easier, simplify puzzles, or even make the meal attacks and dodge trigger by holding the button rather than just, you know, <laughs> tapping them repeatedly. I know, I know, I feel like I'm nitpicking like a little twat, but this feels like the gold standards when it comes to video game accessibility features. Hopefully other gaming studios take note of this just because having a lot of options on how you want to play your game really does help the game a lot. Especially for a versatile game like Spider-Man 2 where yes, there's a linear story where you have to follow but at the same time, it's also an open world game. What makes the game so special even among the Spider-Man media that we get these days is its ability to let players relish the little details. Like Stan Lee said, the beauty of Spider-Man is being him. And while Peter's section mostly pushes the narrative forward in operatic ways, the Miles Morales section makes up the soul of the game in meaningful ways. Much of his storyline is centered around the friendly neighborhood part of Spider-Man. And it's here where the immersion and the length provided by the video game medium set this title apart from prints and movies. Whether it's helping the same-sex high school couple go to a homecoming or tracing Harlem's musical history and defending it from those who hope to co-op it. There's an inclusivity and realness to Mas's story that just comes through moment to moment that's unparalleled in most games. There's one particular side quest that I really want to talk about that really illustrates this the best is a pretty small one. You're basically tasked with finding a missing grandfather. The player must track the man across Brooklyn at the behest of his granddaughter and caretaker. It culminates not in an action set piece but a quiet moment where Miles sits with an elderly battling dementia, ruminating in Prospect Park at the place he proposed to his late wife, reflecting on how these memories will soon be lost to him. It's a stark reminder to Miles and you as the player that this world is populated by real people with their experiences and that is worth fighting for. It's thoughtfully crafted moments like this alongside the hyper polished if not revolutionary gameplay that elevated Marvel Spider-Man 2 above many other single player experiences as well as most other Spider-Man media. That isn't meant to take away from the achievements of successful works like Across the Spider-Verse but for those like myself who are more than a little tired of the multiversal overload of today's entertainment landscape where even great stories require ripping through the space-time continuum to find something worth telling. It's comforting to know that there's room for Spider-Man stories that are told in on the grounded level. Marvel Spider-Man 2 excels at weaving together a web of poignant and personal tales that everyone can relate to which is anyone can be Spider-Man. Which is pretty goddamn surprising that this game barely won nothing at the awards. Like nothing! <laughs> now obviously there's a ton of hype around Baldur's Gate 3 which I have played and enjoyed a lot. Especially since I'm also a big fan of CRPG games or D&D style type of games like Dragon Age Origins. And if you like Dragon Age Origins, I guarantee you, you will love Baldur's Gate 3. It's basically a CRPG game but also a successor to Bioware games like DA, KOTOR, and Mass Effect and 
obviously the original Baldur's Gate games if you're, you know, pretty old to play it like I was. And I understand the level of, you know, replayability from having vastly different playthroughs based on decisions you've made is exceptional. That certain freedom to roleplay with a specific set of rules and limitations and having a totally different experience is just the best. So I fully understand the hype for Baldur's Gate 3. I really, really do. But I still think Marvel Spider-Man 2 should have at least won Game of the Year, in my opinion. And look, this isn't me downplaying Baldur's Gate 3 like some internet troll or hater like some y'all are. I mean, I've given the game its praises, but damn, Spider-Man should have at least won one award. Just one award. Like if I were to rank the Game of the Year nominees, I'd put Marvel Spider-Man 2 at the first spot, Baldur's Gate 3 at the second spot, Legends of Zelda Tears the Kingdom at the third spot, and RE4 at the fourth spot, Alan Wake at the fifth spot, and Super Mario Wonders at the last spot. No offense, Mario fans. Now, disclaimer, this is just my own personal ranking, so you don't have to go crazy if you disagree with it, and that's totally fine. I'm not really going to lose some sleep or get depressed about it like some are, which is weird, but it is what it is. And I kind of understand why Baldur's Gate 3 won from a lenses of someone like myself who also loves CRPG D&D style type of games. It really just depends on what mood you're feeling, like do you want turn-based combat, which I know 90% of the gamers these days, they don't like turn-based combat, which is understandable because it's a really old gaming style system or do you want real time which most of the games today are played in real time so yeah you decide because i'm not gonna make that shit for you because i'm just here to give you the options so yeah i'm going to end the video here so this has been yurinchi and i'll see you soon on the next video